Okay, everybody, let's get going. Okay, here we go. Is Rachel on? Okay. Look at that. Magic. Um, okay. Uh, I think that Stacy on the other side of that speaker. Um, we're going to start, since you're here, uh, with the uh, blueprint. Uh, who wants to kick it off? Rachel, Stacy, either one. So, uh, thank you for having me today. I'm here to help Rachel and Erica as we discuss the changes to um, House Bill 1372, the amendments adopted by the Education, Health, and Environmental Affairs Committee, and the House. So, uh, Rachel's going to start, and she's going to take you through the reprint. We're just going to go page by page, and we're going to start on page one, and Rachel's going to start with some of the fiscal issues. Rachel? Thank you. Um, and just a reminder, I can't see anybody, so I don't necessarily know who's talking or what's happening in the room. My, my uh, first question is, how is it that EHE's bills are in smaller print than everybody else's? <laughs> you got you to gotta jam it in there. I think you got to jam more stuff into their bills. Go ahead, Rachel. I'm sorry. That's all right. <laughs> so everybody... You should have the reprint on your desk, and the First Amendment is on page 6, um, in lines 4 through 6. The House added a requirement, or not a requirement, but a direction that the school boards uh, prioritize the purchase of digital devices um, with the additional education technology funds that are being added to uh, the Blueprint 2.0 bill. The next amendment. Senator Rosepep. Uh, uh, Jim Rosepep. I actually have a question on that. So, which is which money is this referring to? It's referring to the additional funds that are being added to the foundation amounts in starting fiscal twenty five for the um, school boards to um, have additional funds for education. Okay, this is what this is what you and I, I've worked on together. It's that money. Yes. 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 And so this language that says prioritize devices over, I don't quite understand it. It maybe doesn't mean anything. I mean, it says prioritize the purchase of devices for the funds. I mean, the three big buckets are connectivity, devices, and tech support. So right. the point of this is to say buy devices and don't worry about whether they're connected and don't worry about whether anyone knows how to operate them. I, mean, that I, I doubt that's the intent, but it sort of implies that. I think the House wanted to, uh, as a first sort of bar, make sure that every student has a, a digital device that they can use. So this is kind of like intent language? I mean, how do, you, how do, we, how do we know whether this happened or didn't happen? It's a little stronger than intent language, but to your point, how would how would we know? Gotcha. Okay. Th thank you, Mr. Chairman. I, I have an amendment. I, th I think you know later uh -huh. uh, on this issue. So. Thank you. Okay, Rachel. 
Okay, the next amendment uh, from the House is on page seven and eight. Uh, at the bottom of page seven, it adds um, current law language regarding the, um, this is the hold harmless in the compensatory education formula for school systems that participate in the community eligibility provision. And this extends the hold harmless for one more year through fiscal 26. Um, I will tell you, based on our projections, um, the hold harmless really won't have an impact in 26. So this is kind of a belt and suspenders kind of amendment. The next amendment is on page nine of the bill. And uh, this starts into the section related to the concentration of poverty grants. Um, the First Amendment is technical, just clarifying the definition in lines 15 to 18 and also uh, 19 and 20. Um, after line 23 in italics is language um, that the uh, Education, Health and Environmental Affairs Committee, uh, an amendment that adjusts uh, the use of excess personnel grant funds under current law the schools are able to use those monies for needs assessments and um, to fulfill some Comar requirements. This amendment would require the schools to use the money for health care services uh, for students in the school uh, using either the school health services program, a health department, or a school-based health center. And then on the bottom of uh, page 9 onto page 10, uh, the amendment that the House adopted um, in lines 13 through 15 um, ensures that every school receives its full per pupil grant beginning 2030. Under the bill as introduced, the uh, schools at the highest concentrations of poverty at 80% and above uh, are receiving an accelerated phase in and that phase in sort of extended the time that other schools would get to 100%. This provision makes sure that all schools get to 100% in fiscal 2030. And then below that, they added a reporting requirement for this fall on, um, uh, there's a study that MSDE is uh, doing looking at neighborhood poverty indicators. And so this is an interim report for them to report back on that and um, a couple of other things related to um, concentration of poverty. Senator Eckert has a question. Thank, thank you very much, Rachel. Is, I'm concerned about the funding. The amount is this, um, the blueprint money that we passed in the bill last year, or is this, a, are these additional resources? When uh, you, for the, and it for the 100%? Percent? Yes. Oh, oh is, any of these. You've done a number of these, and I'm just trying to get straight. Which is the foundation blueprint money, and which is the additional add-on funds? So the only add-on funds are the uh, educational technology funds, and those were at those were it added to uh, in the bill as introduced. The changes in the concentration of poverty grant are really um it, it's it's cost neutral it's just altering the year in which schools receive a certain amount of funding the bill as introduced actually generated some savings unintentionally in concentration of poverty grants and this would eliminate those savings and kind of go back to spending all of the concentration of poverty grant money beginning in fiscal 2030. Okay, thank you, thank you very much. I, I just, I just need to know the overall cost impact when we get there to our local jurisdictions. Thanks, but I'm trying to keep it straight in my head. Thanks. Okay. I think it, uh, it's back to Stacy. Okay, we're going to jump ahead to page 13 of your reprint. 
And then in lines uh, one through five, uh, EHE added an amendment that clarified that um, a specified reading screening satisfied the requirement for the pre-standardized assessment that must be given to a student who's receiving transitional supplemental instruction. There was a law passed in 2019 that required these screenings. And uh, this is saying that they work together. So the next amendment, I think, is all the way on page 17 in your packet. And starting on line 9 there, uh, this is clarifying language that the AIB has plenary authority over matters within its jurisdiction. And that if there's a conflict between it and the state board, the, a the AIB's decision or policy controls in that conflict. That was a House amendment. Uh, further down on this page in line, after line 24, there is an incentive to the appointing officials for timely appointment of members of the nominating committee that nominates members to the accountability and implementation board. So the way this would work is if um, two members appoint the individuals to the nominating committee and the third member fails to do so within 30 days, then the language in subsection D that you see right there becomes abrogated and of no effect. Uh, previously, that language would have required uh, any decision to be a majority vote to include at least one vote in the majority by each member appointed by the governor, the president, and the speaker. And so this language would no longer be in the bill should that third individual not appoint in a timely manner. So I know that we're uh, certainly happy to have you have a question, Senator. This is, this is part of the stuff that's outside of our purview. Well, I understand. I'm just trying to understand it. Okay. I appreciate it. Yeah. So is the implication of that that if one of them doesn't appoint somebody, the two who are appointed just go ahead and act? Am no. The, it's to encourage a timely appointment. So they have to all appoint. But instead of when the board or the nominating committee is fully appointed and they go to make appointments to the AIB before, in order to get a majority vote, you would have to have a vote from at least one appointment from one from the speaker, one from the president, one from the governor. That language would become inoperative if that third individual does not appoint to the nominating committee in a right. timely manner. Well, that's what the timely manner thing that confuses me. So it's an incentive to make sure that all of the appointing officials appoint because I, I, there's I, some. I, I, I get the incentive piece of it. I'm just saying mechanically, I'm just trying to understand. If one of them doesn't appoint, if two of them do appoint and one of them doesn't ever, the two just go ahead and make the decisions? I don't know if there's a mechanism for that. Rachel, do you have a thought on that? You're on mute. I think I would agree with Senator Rosenbaum, uh, because there's, you know, ultimately there's no, the requirement for all three to appoint was really because one from each appointee had to be voting in the majority. But if, if that is no, no longer there, then the third person would wouldn't have to ever make appointments. They also wouldn't have any. Okay, uh, that, that's all. That's all I want to clarify how it's going to be enforced, and that's how it's enforced. I got it. Okay, thank you. Are you ready to move on? Yes, please. Okay, uh, moving down that page on line twenty six. Um, this says that the comprehensive implementation plan shall include the intended outcomes that the blueprint for Maryland's future will achieve. This was technical as this was just moved to a different part of the bill. Um, and as discussed in EHE yesterday, this probably references those provisions in a section 1-303 of the education article, which essentially lists um, some of the outcomes that the blueprint is achieving with its goals. So the next amendment is on page 23. Wait, actually page 20, excuse me. And this is a House amendment, and this would require um, MSDE to send expert review team to a school or group of schools 
um, that continue to demonstrate learning loss that began uh, regarding the COVID-19 pandemic. And the purpose of that would be determine why the learning loss is persisting in those particular schools. Okay, moving to page 23, uh, starting on line 25, this is essentially a technical correction. Rachel, can you clarify that a little bit? That's the kindergarten slots. Sure, this, is a, this was actually an amendment that um, the Child Care Association uh, brought to our attention, and I, I know uh, Senator King and others um, wanted to make sure this was addressed. So this deals with the pre-kindergarten requirement that private providers um, provide slots that make up a, a certain minimum percentage of the total slots. And this is, it's a technical correction, but it's, it's an important correction uh, to have the percentage be as a, a percent of the total slots being provided. So um, we wanna make sure that eligible private providers are providing at least 30% of the total slots uh, each year, beginning in fiscal 23, and then uh, further down the page, it increases to the 50% starting in fiscal 27, and um, in paragraph three there, after fiscal 27. So it's really just changing it from referring to the providers to the slots, which is what was intended. Okay, page 26 is the next set of amendments. Wait. Thank you very much. Is that percentage reasonable and average for each of our counties? <clears throat> I mean, um, if a county doesn't have that. I, I would say it is, uh, it might be aspirational for some counties, um, but it is, uh, begins in fiscal 23 now for the 30% minimum. Um, but the intent of this language is to um, ensure that private providers who are, are in the counties, um, are participating in the public program if they wish to. There is a waiver provision um, that allows the department to waive the percentage requirement if there is not sufficient number of providers in the county. Great, thank you. Okay, if there's no more questions. Um, page 26 of your reprint, uh, starting on line one. This is clarifying language put in by the house that the blueprint and the college and career ready standards aren't intended to alter the need for a holistic education, meaning they still want content in fine arts, civics, physical education, and those types of subject matter areas. Um, in line 14, uh, there is language that requires uh, the State Department of Education to consult with the AIB when contracting con to conduct the adequacy study of the college and career ready standard. Senator McCray has a question. Thank, thank you, Mr. Chair. Stacey, sorry, uh, two amendments ago, um, page 20 in reference to the expert review teams. I remember when we were first discussing it, I was kind of asking the question like, uh, did we have enough with the expert review teams? I think that Rachel was uh, let me know that maybe they'll get to every school uh, quarterly, like a quarterly type of thing. But like, what happens? So learning loss is gonna be a reality for a number of our schools. Like, what was the vision of EHE when they put this amendment in? What did they do once they obtained that learning loss is happening? Because that's gonna be common. It's not gonna be some. Well, this wasn't EE's vision. This was the house's vision. Okay. Uh, so I can't say for sure, but I must, the purpose of an expert review team in general is to visit the schools and find out the, you know, the root causes for why those students in that school aren't learning and to get in there and work with the faculty and the administrators to find out how they can do best practices to make the school better. So assuming that 
that's the intended goal for expert review teams, this would be a, like a, a strike team to go in and these persistent learning losses, they're not catching up as quickly or whatnot. So these, these students and these schools would get the benefit of the, the most um, comprehensive type of uh, look at, at their practices. So I'm assuming that would be the reason that they asked for this. All right, thank, thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Stacey. Okay. okay. All right, moving on to page 27. So uh, in line seven, what this does is it includes advanced placement courses in high schools in the post-college and career ready CTE pathway. Uh, further down on that page, starting after line 21, uh, this, re this is an amendment in the EHE that requires virtual schools established by county boards under specified existing provisions of law to meet a certain quality online education standard beginning in the 21-22 school year. Next is on page 28. <clears throat> And this amendment would require the CTE committee or the State Board of Education, as appropriate, to include in the state plan for the CTE Perkins Act the goals and programs consistent with the blueprint to the extent consistent with federal law. I believe Senator Rosapet was very interested in that provision. You bet. <laughs> so moving on, I think the next amendment is on page 32. Okay, sure. Um, so in line 19, this refers to the work group on English language learners in public schools, and this would require that work group to measure and make recommendations to address learning loss in this particular student population. Senator Acker has a question. I have lots of questions. Um, um, thank you very much, Mr. Chair. On page 27 regarding the virtual schools, does it specifies a county um, but does that encompass counties who might want to go together to do a regional virtual school? Let me see here. Mm -hmm. So this is existing law, and this existing law allows a county board of education to establish a virtual school. And so this would just be clarifying language that said that the virtual school created by the county would have to meet those standards. I'm not sure what you're... Okay. Senator, where's the top? I, I think I know what Senator Eckert's referring to is there's a group of Eastern Shore counties that are talking about going in together right. on one. Is that what right. you're referring to? Yes. Right. Did, and did, I'll did, be honest with you, I don't know the answer because I don't have the law in front of me, the, the full statute to take a look and see whether this particular provision applies to those schools. Okay, but this issue was not discussed in EHE or, it was in, the, not, no. or in the House? No. I, I, I would encourage you to look at that issue because yeah. it's like a real-time thing right now. Thank you. There. Exactly, and I just wanted to make sure that what pertains for one county would pertain to a group of any group of counties who may want to work together on this. For I will make a note system. of that and take a look. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Because it's happening. Okay. Okay. You were on page, I think we're on page 34 now. So these provisions starting on line 23 refer to the new programs regarding summer school for students uh, to deal with some of the effects of the COVID-19 pandemic. And so the language in line 26 clarifies that rising kindergarten students that are eligible that for publicly funded pre-K are eligible to participate in the summer school programs. Um, in line 28, there's language that clarifies the academic instruction in reading and math has to be aligned with not only the county board's curriculum, it, it could be the public school's curriculum. In line 34, um, this amendment it requires in 2021 that the program shall incorporate the county's program for providing free meals in the summer. 
That's uh, that's a mandatory versus a discretionary. On page 35, uh, this is another EHE amendment. Uh, this requires county boards to offer transportation to students who need transportation to participate in the summer school programs. Um, further down in lines two through four, this is a house amendment, um, which uh, makes slight modifications to this that may offer incentive pay for teachers and other school employees, uh, including higher comp, loan forgiveness, tuition assistance, subject to collective bargaining as applicable. Also a little bit further down on line 19, there is a, requires the county board to use state and federal funding provided for the programs at no additional cost to public schools. In line 26, again, this clarifies, we're moving into tutoring and supplemental instruction for the 2021-2022 uh, school years. Again, that the curriculum aligns with the county boards or a public school's curriculum by grade and subject. Moving on to page 36. Uh, this authorizes the inclusion of science or social studies tutoring for middle school as well as for high school students. Starting on lines uh, five, we're talking about pre and post assessment to evaluate the student progress. And again, keep in mind, this is tutoring and supplemental instruction. The house added amendment that these assessments must accurately measure literacy, mathematical competency and any other academic competency be aligned with the content area in which the tutoring is provided and may be selected by a school or a county board. And that they uh, use state and federal funding provided for COVID relief in the budget to expand the tutoring programs. And I think the last page here that there's an amendment, well here on amendments on page 37 so this modifies a couple of reporting requirements. So um, the county board, including Baltimore City, are required to report to the AIB on tutoring provided that we just discussed. And then there's provisions for the information that's uh, to required. And there was a modification made to that. So the models of tutoring, they have to discuss including pupil to tutor ratio or group sizes, frequency of sessions, amount of time per session, and the number of sessions provided. The House added amendment uh, starting on line 10, um, uh, discussing disaggregation of student data by various categories, race, ethnicity, gender, disability status, English language learner status, and socioeconomic status. And then also further on that page, starting on line 18, the House added another amendment where the county board is required to report to the AIB and the Legislative Policy Committee of the General Assembly on a plan for spending their fiscal 2022 funds. And then there's various categories of what they're required to report. EHE added an amendment after line 27 regarding metrics and procedures um, to evaluate the effectiveness and impact of behavioral health services. And then I think on the last page here, on page 38, is an additional house amendments here. Uh, in line six, I mean line 13, excuse me, this requires the Department of Legislative Services to conduct a study on the impact of the implementation of the blueprint on county governments uh, regarding to meet the local maintenance of effort requirements as annual amounts increase in future years. And then I think this is the final amendment here after line 22 added by EHE and that uh, requires each local school system by October of this year to complete a virtual learning self-assessment and to report on the findings of that assessment. And that on 
by December 1 of 2023, the department is required to conduct an evaluation of each virtual school and report on its findings. Thank you. Are there any questions on what has been presented so far? Okay. Are there any additional amendments? Senator Roosevelt? Yes. Um, does the staff have, does, who on the staff has it? There you are. Erica? Oh, there we go. <laughs> yeah, on your desk is a packet of amendments that were um, provided to the committee in advance of this voting session. Um, and I believe the first page um, reflects the one that Senator Rosa Pep is getting ready to speak on. Yep. You want just to explain it? Or um, I can uh, basically, um, I can quickly, however you Please, want to. Go ahead, no, go ahead, go ahead. Okay. Um, so this refers back to page six of the bill um, where Senator Rosa Pep raised the question about the additional um, amount of money that's embedded into the foundation per pupil amount for education technology. What this amendment does is um, it adds on to the existing language in the reprint before you that this additional money is intended to supplement, not supplant. It also establishes two reporting requirements that are related. The first one having each county board to submit um, kind of budgetary information on, on what they've been spending um, and the percent of students that um, these digital devices and, and connectivity um, have access to. And then uh, a month later, the State Department of Education would then compile that and submit it to you all. Um, and then finally, um, as you can imagine, getting reports from 24 different school districts um, can be complicated. So this language also requires the department to establish uniform reporting requirements, including data definitions and things like that, so uh, they can be consistent and comparable. And then one last thing, um, in the back of the bill, there's a provision that generally authorizes county boards to spend federal funds on some things. And this would add um, that they can also use those federal funds to provide this education technology. Folks understand this amendment? Is there a motion? Yes, Senator Zucker. Senator Rose, thank you for this. It's good. I just had a quick question. Um, Knowing, knowing the department, when are they going to establish the uniform reporting requirements? I must say that thought crossed my mind as I was reading this. I just want to make sure they do it. I, I agree with you. I agree with you. I'm, I'm open to a friendly amendment that puts a deadline in it, if, if that would make sense. When is the first report? What is the first? Uh, when is the first report due? Sorry. Right now, um, it just says of each year, so really it would be this coming fall once this bill becomes effective. Rachel, do you have any thoughts on that? I mean, you could. You Rachel? Could, you could do by a September. We can't hear you. And I could not hear the question. I'm sorry. Okay. Sure. Can you hear me okay? Yeah. Okay. I apologize. Um, I only have one mask on, though, now five, even though it looks big. Um, so in, in this great amendment, it says on item three, it says the department shall establish uniform reporting requirements, right? As, as Ms. Schuster said, it's to make sure that everybody's on the same sheet of music. So the only concern I had was, will they, will they establish the uniform reporting requirements after the first report is due? Okay. So, um, I guess let me let me put it this way. And in paragraph two, it talks about the additional funds being provided in the target per pupil amount, not supplanting um, existing funding. And so, this uh, is probably a question for Senator Rosapath. Did you want this report to start um, right away? Yes. Or when the increases in the target no 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 definitely, definitely right away with the federal money okay okay so then i think we would want to say you would want to require the department to establish the
the uniform reporting requirements by maybe September 1st of, of this year, 2021? Second. <laughs> Is that okay? Yeah. Yeah. As long as long. Yes. That's a great idea. Thank you very, very much. Senator Alfred. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, Senator, I'm supportive of the amendment, but I'm just looking at the, the sheet on the it's second in our package. Erica, is this related to the? I think it's related to the next amendment. It's, it's not related to the Okay, issue. then I will hold until we address the sheet. I support the amendment. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> okay, as amended, uh, all those in favor? As The amendment as amended. Unanimous. Okay. Thank you. Next amendment. All right. As Senator Alfred has pointed out, the next one in your chart is not an amendment. It is a a, um, a chart of calculations having to do with a topic about the maintenance of effort and some adjustments, um, mostly technical in nature, that need to happen in here. I'm going to turn it over to Rachel to walk you through um, this chart and with the proposed change. Rachel, okay. go ahead. Yep. So everyone has, I think, in front of them um, a chart um, that is related to fiscal 23 maintenance of effort per pupil requirement. Uh, this amendment has to do with language that is on page 15 and 16 of the bill related to how uh, maintenance of the per pupil maintenance of effort requirement will be calculated for fiscal 23. The bill included a provision related to this because the impact of um, the declining enrollment in this past fall due to the pandemic has sort of this uh, rolling effect on several formulas. And one of them is maintenance of effort. And so um, as introduced, the bill uh, attempted to provide some corrections for the impact of the pandemic on uh, maintenance of effort. And the first correction was to use the fiscal 21 local appropriation rather than the fiscal 22 appropriation, which is what would normally be used as the starting point to calculate fiscal 23 MOE. But um, because of the, um, the lower enrollment in this past fall, it actually has the impact of um, allowing uh, some counties to reduce their maintenance of effort in fiscal 22. And so as a result, there's a provision in the Budget Reconciliation and Financing Act um, that you actually uh, passed second reading today that uh, would require counties to increase their fiscal 21 local appropriation in order to receive the hold harmless grant for their counties. So that provision uh, for some counties will mean that they would increase their fiscal 22 appropriation more than they would have otherwise. And the thing with maintenance of effort is once you uh, increase your appropriation, um, maintenance of effort requires you to maintain that level on a per pupil basis forever going forward. So um, what the bill did is it, it started with fiscal 21 local appropriation instead of fiscal 22, so that counties would, would go ahead and increase their appropriation in 22, so the school systems get their hold harmless, but not be permanently required to fund at that higher level. So the fiscal 21 column on your chart shows those amounts uh, as the starting point under the bill. Um, however, um, what we did not take into account is that some counties are going to be required to put in more than they did in fiscal 21 because of a provision in the law that we call the MOE escalator. And this is a provision that requires counties that are making a below average effort uh, in their education funding to increase their funding um, through the maintenance of effort formula um, each year if they are if they are found to be below uh, the average effort. When and so that by- when did, count, when did that law take effect? Rachel, did you hear my question? Yes. I, I was asking when that law, when did that law take effect? Oh, um, 2012, but um, the, the escalator provision um, 
was first applied in fiscal 2018. Okay, thank you. You can continue, I'm sorry. So the next column in the chart, what is, what is being proposed um, is for the counties that are, fund, are required to fund the escalator in fiscal 22, um, we do not intend to, you know, deduct that from the appropriation to be um, used in the calculation for fiscal 23. So the second column there shows the counties that are subject to the escalator in fiscal 22. And so the starting point would be the numbers for those counties would be the numbers in the second column. Um, and there are 14 counties um, that are subject to the escalator for this, for this upcoming fiscal year. So that's the first part of the, um, of this amendment. The second part also deals with the escalator and it relates to um, calculating which counties are, are subject to the escalator and also what the percentage is. Um, and so again, it has to do with the impact of the pandemic. Normally the escalator is calculated using for fiscal 23, it would use fiscal 22 wealth and fall of 2020 enrollment. But, but that it creates a, a, a false calculation because of the drop in uh, enrollment this past fall. And so the amendment would use fall of 2019 enrollment instead to determine which counties are subject to the escalator. And then um, it would also use the uh, percentage, the appropriate percentage based on that calculation for each county. And those numbers are seen in that third column. So any, any county that has a number greater than zero would be subject to the escalator in fiscal 23. Then the final column. Another qu question from Senator Eckert. And so those counties are primarily disparity counties in Baltimore City, correct? Not necessarily. Some are, some, some aren't. Um, Queen Anne's is not. Worcester, Worcester is not. Just, yep, oh, but two, I think. Thank you. Okay. So the final column shows the combined impact of the two um, amendments um, on each county relative to what their estimated total maintenance of effort requirement will be in fiscal 23, keeping in mind that fiscal 23 will now be the first year that each county is required to fund the local share of all of the formulas. Um, and so you can see that there is a net impact on um, 10 counties. So in other words, if, if even though on the calculation in, in, in column three, if you're at zero, you can still have impact from column two. Is that correct? Exactly. Because the maintenance of effort is being calculated off of a, a higher local appropriation. Questions about what's going on here? Thoughts? Anything? Okay. Do we need to accept this as an amendment? Okay. Who's favorable on the amendment? Second. Okay. All those in favor of the amendment. Every 
all but Senator Eckert right now. I don't know about Senator. Did Senator Peters leave? Yeah, I'll, I'll check with him. Okay. Okay. Um. Uh, so the next page in your packet is an amendment offered from Senator Alfred. Uh This has to do with um, the bill last year dealt with um, establishing a you know community school structure. So if you're a concentration of poverty school, you also have to be a community school. Um, and the bill required that the State Department um, hire a director of community schools to kind of coordinate and work with all the county level um, coordinators. What this amendment does is in addition to any funding provided for that director position, that an additional $100,000 should be included so that the director can provide training, technical assistance, and for additional staff. That's the amendment in a crux. Okay. Any thoughts? Is there a motion? Favorable. Second? Okay. All those in favor? Senator Sot? Senator Young? Yeah. Okay. Unanimous? Okay. Next right. up. Uh, the next one in your packet is from Senator Washington. This deals with the exact same topic, but it was structured in a little different way. Um, also including $100,000 to increase up to 200000 by 2028 and um, for that additional funding to be used for, you know, vastly the same purposes. Um, and I think one, you know, one point of clarification that um, the, the director within MSD is currently funded in the current budget. Um, so this, you know, Senator Alfres makes sure that it's in addition to that um, and not to be used to pay for the existing position because that's already incorporated in the budget. So it doesn't seem necessary from my perspective, so I have to move unfavorable. Second. All those in favor? Other than favorable. Okay. Next. <coughs> Pardon me. Um, this next amendment would add um, a study and reporting requirement. Um, by January 1 of 2022, the State Department of Education would contract um, with an entity to do uh, basically to look at the adequacy of the state education formulas as in the blueprint and then to report those to the General Assembly. Uh, and then uh, in B, and moving on to the back page, it just gives a little more uh, specificity as to what the study shall evaluate. So um, from my perspective on this one, the, um, this, uh, <laughs> the whole blueprint is about the adequacy and finding right. the adequacy. It just right. seems kind of early on unnecessary. I agree. Okay, move on favorable. Okay. All those in favor of the unfavorable. Okay. Excuse me. Oh, please do. I just want to be sure, and Rachel, you probably know this better than, than anybody here. I, I want to make sure that we're not asking for so many reports and so many study groups over the interim that we just get bogged down with that and really don't do what we need to do. Do you know where we are as far as study groups and reportings and that kind of stuff? She didn't hear me. Um, sorry, was that a question for me? Yeah, I'm yeah, sorry. I, I think really it, hard as it relates hear. to education, how many uh, new and additional reports are being requested that, or actually have passed so far at this point throughout the process is, I think, your question. Is that correct? Yeah. I just want to be sure we're not bogging people down. We've done this before with reports and, and that kind of stuff. I mean, we've done it to MSDE before. So they spend all their time doing reports rather than doing what they need to do. So I just want to be sure we're not doing that again this year. She didn't hear me. Did, do you, Rachel, do you have some sense of how many we've requested additionally this year? Uh, I really do not. Okay. I mean, it's certainly something I think we're all concerned about. Yeah. It's a good point, sir. Okay, let's move on to the next one. All right, um, the next one pertains to um, 
again, back to the concentration of poverty provisions, you'll recall that there's uh, two phases of funding for schools that qualify for this. The first one is they would be provided a, um, a personnel grant to hire the um, community schools coordinator. Um, and this particular provision that this amendment is striking is the one that would um, re that would set the, the, the amount of that grant. Um, which is different than in current law, it's 257000 This amount, basically due to the veto override and the delay of the bill um, and some inflationary adjustments, um, this bill was introduced with 248833 as that <coughs> personnel grant, um, and this amendment would strike that provision. Senator Griffith. Yes, thank you, Mr. Chairman, and I may need that explained one more time, but I was just trying to get a sense, were these offered in EHE or they're being offered here first because they're related to fiscal? Yeah, so they were offered in both, um, okay. but because of the different jurisdictions, um, EHE decided to have this one be addressed by this committee. So they haven't acted on it? Uh, no, they have not acted on this. Okay, do you mind giving me the rewind and just quick <laughs> replay on what you just said? <laughs> no. well, they didn't do. <laughs> yeah, so... Um, so within the concentration of poverty, there is a personnel grant. That's kind of the first streaming once you become eligible for that, and that's to hire a community schools coordinator to get that process started with wraparound services. The bill last year established what that grant amount should be. Um, the bill introduced this year alters that grant amount to adjust, and Rachel, if you can chime in a little bit here, to adjust for inflation that has occurred um, or not occurred as a result of the bill being delayed with the veto override. Um, so that new amount would be 248833 So that's what's in the bill now. This particular amendment would strike that and go back to current law. Uh, uh, what's the two different numbers? Yeah, the first number in existing law is 257, and then this in the bill right now is 248. I think... Rachel, would you mind chiming in because this the two four the new number is, uh, you know, has some logic behind it. Um, it's not just a reduction. Right. So, so changing the number for fiscal twenty two, um, it, it's too late. <laughs> that wouldn't that wouldn't take effect. So um, the amount that the personnel grant will increase to in fiscal twenty three, based on the current bill is 253,350 and the amendment is increasing that to 257,100. Um, so that would be an increase of about $3,750 per school. So not insignificant if you add it all up. Is that what you're saying? Correct. What's the combined total? Do we know? Did you ask for the combined total? Yes, please. Um, it would increase. Uh, it's about 1.3 million. Right. So I think we were trying to steer ourselves clear of additional uh, spending on this, other than what we focused on in terms of the, the summer school stuff, right? Um, so I'll move unfavorable. All those in favor of the unfavorable. Senator Eckert, were you in that one? Yeah. Okay. Very good. Next up. Alrighty, yes. Um, the last one in your packet deals with um, an amendment to what we refer to as Section 19. Um, last year, uh, an amendment was added in the set, uh, to the bill last year. Basically, we called it the um, like the revenue check-in. This provided um, if revenues, state revenues were to decrease by at least 7.5%, that all of the various um, increases in the in the formulas that were in the bill last year um, would stop and instead just revert to inflationary increases. Um, as introduced, the bill does have some technical corrections to that, um, just um, to make sure it was an ongoing check, not just in a single year. Um, what this amendment does is basically saying that when that ha if there is a 7.5% decrease in the general fund estimates, revenue estimates, that um, the per pupil formula increases would resume in the next upcoming fiscal year. Um, and then 
and then the increases would be adjusted to offset any shortfall resulting from the freeze at inflation. Okay, so um, so at first I thought this might be okay, but then I realized that once the check-in is um, a sta once the um, it is triggered, once it's triggered, then uh, it would go on um, from that point forward. And I thought, oh, well, we should probably have a way to, to deal with that. But the reality is, once it is, then we've got to go back and look at what the whole formula anyway. So it's not like we wouldn't be acknowledging this. We've got to do that um, at that point. So uh, I think it's reasonable to reject this because w there's no way we could even move forward um, on an annual basis year after year if we hadn't gone back and checked, uh, re reevaluated the whole the, the, pro the program. So I'm going to move unfavorable. Second. Everybody understand? No. Okay. <laughs> I trust you. <laughs> Enough. Enough. Enough? Okay. <laughs> All those in favor of the unfavorable. <laughs> All right. Um, so that completes any amendments that were uh, submitted to the committee in advance. Okay. Um, I think we might want to, Senator uh, Zucker, do you want to go back to that chart for a second? I think there was a question you might have. That, uh, sorry, I missed it. No, it's all right, it's all right Mr. Chairman. We were. Uh, Doing good work. So I just wanted to, in terms of, um, you know, I understand the chart that was provided, and I understand that this is sort of just clarifying intent. Um, it's an aid to, aid to education, this chart, uh, in uh, the analysis uh, on graph 14. But, um, you know, we have this federal money coming in, so I thought that, um, you know, it, we would just clarify intent language that says that, uh, to help the counties, they should utilize the federal money, and that way it's not coming out of their 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 bottom line, that they would be able to use the, the, the federal money to basically help hold them harmless. Can you, Rachel, can you figure out a way to make that fit into the, fit in somewhere? So, so right now, yeah, so basically, so right now this is just clarifying intent, so, but, there's still an impact to locals, right? The locals are going to have to pay, which they know. But since there's federal money coming in, they can use the federal money to offset the local the local share that they would have been paying. So that way it doesn't come out of their bottom line. They're just utilizing the federal funds. Yeah. We can certainly come up with language if that's the, the will of the body. I mean, it's there. I mean, you know, the interest, one of the reasons that this, this chart, um, I feel more comfortable with is because there is so much federal money coming in. And if you look at, I'm, I'm sure, I don't know if everybody's seen these charts, but um, the significant amount of money that's coming into local governments, um, uh, $1.8 billion, um, uh, it seems reasonable to me um, that looking at whatever differences that, that again, the, these are things they, they knew they needed to accomplish accomplish this is just a uh, it's just uh, I guess a statement saying that um, the money clearly is there from a local government perspective it wasn't ex that wasn't expected Senator Roosevelt. Yeah, I, I'm, I'm on board in spirit but I don't really understand the math so if we don't adopt this amendment what's the alternative to this? I'm sorry It's the local share, so the local would pay. So, so we're saying be the local the local government's got, got a bunch of federal money, and the school system's got a bunch of federal money. Yeah. And so we're saying, just the put local in your government's own words, responsible for the MOE, though. That they can use that the local government can use or should use the federal government to meet their MOE. Is that essentially what we're saying? It's it's certainly well there. I mean, certainly the money is there. Well, the money is there, but I mean, well, that's what we say we want them to do. Got it. Okay. No, that, 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 that's what I was trying to understand. Thank you. Senator Alfred. 
Thank you, Mr. Chair. Obviously, looking at the chart, my, my district, my county is impacted the most. And so Senator Zucker's amendment is going to help kind of ease the pain of this first year of getting, I mean, it's a maintenance of effort, so it's, it's only going to be compounded after fiscal 23, but using the federal money is going to help, you know, get the pill down easier for this first year. So I would, I would I mean, second the amendment. Anyway. That's what I would, yeah. It, no, I don't think, we're, I don't know that we're giving them permission. I think we're just clarifying that we think it makes sense that, that, that it's, it's all there. Okay. Okay. Senator Eckert. Um, yeah, thank you very much. No, I'm just trying to get my head around this because I thought this was a heavy hit to a number of our disparity counties, and it actually is heavy a hit to our non-disparity counties, I'm sure. And so I'm just trying to understand the impact of COVID to our local jurisdictions that we haven't fully realized, the influx of additional money and then worried about the perfect storm because the COVID, the CARES money or the funds that are coming down for relief or whatever you want to call it are only good till 24. And if the counties wind up having a structural deficit, um, once that money goes away, then they're going to be hit even harder with the MOE, correct? Worst case scenario? Rachel, did you hear the question? Do you want me to um, say it again, Rachel? I, 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 didn't hear, I didn't hear an actual question. Okay. My concern is, would you, wouldn't you agree, A, for many of our counties, we have not realized the economic impact of COVID. For, particularly for our low-income counties. But it's also significantly impacted our higher-income counties. The CARES money, the federal money that's coming in, is only good until 24. You can't save it. You can't put it away to offset the MOE in 25 or 26. So if your county winds up at the end of 18 months having a major structural deficit, then we are in worse financial shape when the COVID money goes away than we were when we did the blueprint originally last year, correct? Correct, the COVID money will go away um, and this will be um, an, an ongoing cost. It would have been higher if all things being equal and schools were not closed and students attended in-person school enrollments would have been higher and the county the impact of the escalator for the counties in fiscal 23 would be larger than than these impacts so um what this is really doing is um trying to implement the intent of the escalator law um, so that counties are that are making lower effort than the average in the state um, have increased their their local appropriation to their school systems under the the Kerwin bill fiscal 23 is the last year for the escalator so there will be there will be no more annual bumps from the escalator after fiscal 23. But according to the chart, if we take, for instance, Dorchester, regardless of that, even with the adjustment on the chart, it's still going to be 20.7 million each year, right? 20.7 million is the fiscal 22. That is what under current law under 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 the bill and under current law this is what the uh dorchester county will pay in fiscal 22. so that's not an increase so the impact so in 23 if you look over in the far right column the impact is zero for dorchester 
Yeah, but so it stays at that, right? It's that. It yeah. I mean, there's no in, There is no impact on Dorchester County from this these proposed amendments in fiscal twenty three. And they're out. Well, there's no escalator past twenty three. Right. So sure. it's st that's what I'm saying. It still increases it from twenty point three, which was a heavy lift then, to twenty point seven in 22 and they're out so yeah you could maybe offset a little bit with the covid money between now and then but in 24 then when you withdraw that and you have a major underlying structural deficit you're further behind financially that's the existing law right rachel yeah i'm just uh, whether um whether it is excuse me whether it is or whether it isn't it is right I mean, it's right. I, I guess what I'm trying to figure out is, is this, I don't think this amendment is, is hurting your situation. It actually, does it improve the situation, Rachel? Not really. Improve, improve the situation? Is that what you said relative to what? To, yeah. to what would have happened had we not had the provision in the BRFA and not had this idea of holding harmless. Um, so the BRFA provision relates to fiscal 22. This chart is about fiscal 23. So if I, I'm trying to understand if the questions are really about fiscal 22. I think, or about I, I, I think I'm trying, I think if I'm going to try to help maybe rephrase Senator Eckert's question. Is that she's obviously whatever numbers are established in these next couple of years, even though there's not an escalator, you still have a base established for the MOE. And what she's saying, and I guess what the question is, does this amendment in any way change what would have been before in terms of the long term adding some number to 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 the base of for instance, Dorchester's MOE. It doesn't. It doesn't change what Kerwin was doing, but because of the pandemic and the impact on the formulas, an adjustment is needed to to implement the original intent. Does that help? Senator Eckert, does that help? Kinda, she says. No, not, well, excuse that's, that's all right. It's, it's not, not, it's just leave it alone. Thank you. Okay. Okay. So, uh, everyone understand we're just adding some language saying, look, you got this federal money and it certainly might be useful for you for this purpose. You guys will work it out. Okay? Yeah. Everybody good with that? No, anybody have a problem? Okay. Very good. All right. So we have now made it through all of the amendments. Yes? All those submitted, yes. Okay. So on the bill, as amended. Okay. Motion a second. All those in favor of the bill is amended. And opposed? Okay. Um, yes. So the vote in Ehi was near unanimous, right? It was. Okay. It, it was near near unanimous. I said. Yep. 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 Okay. Ten one. Okay. Every committee gets to do what it thinks is best. It was near. That's right. All right. Um, let's move on. To uh, uh, one seventy two. Thank you, Stacy. Thank you, Rachel. Thanks, Rachel. Oh, that's right. Why am I waving? <laughs> I'm waving at Stacy. <laughs>
Senate Bill 172, this is the Health Equity Resource Act. Um, since you voted last time, Finance had voted and B&T and Finance had a work group get together to work out some uh, uh, consensus amendments. So what you have before you is a reprint with uh, a few changes from the prior B&T amendments. Uh, there's clarifying language regarding the funding mandate on page 7. Um, substantively, the agreement was to go with the B and T version, where the Community Health Resource Commission would be the uh, entity in, in charge of running the uh, the HERC program. There was um, changes by finance regarding the composition of the advisory committee for the program, and you'll see those on page ten. Uh, basically, the uh, advisory committee under the amendments, the chair of the CHRC or their designee, uh, will be a de facto member. The chair, uh, the director of the Office of Minority Health and Health Disparities, or their designee, and then three appointees by the governor, three by the speaker, three by the uh, president of the Senate. Um, there's also uh, additional language on the top of handwritten page 10 of your reprint, um, clarifying that the Office of Minority Health and Health Disparities shall provide technical assistance to the commission in implementing the, uh, the program. And then finance also added a provision on handwritten 18 of your reprint. Uh, the program had a requirement for um, evaluator positions to be included in the um, designated communities. And this finance amendment um, authorizes um, those communities to contract with HBCUs to provide those evaluator services. And then uh, at the end of the bill, just a Technical change to the uh, sunset termination for the Pathways program. Uh, that's in the beginning of bill. That's the, the program. That's the bridge program with the 14 million from the Relief Act. Um, just aligning the sunset termination with the the length of that program. Okay, everybody understand what's happened. All right. Is there a motion? Favorable. All those in favor, the bill is amended unanimous. All right. Um, 261. All right, Mr. Chair. Um, Senate Bill 261, this is a local bill for Anne Arundel County. You do have a letter of support from their delegation. This would authorize the county to grant a property tax credit. Um, on county property tax that's imposed on real property that's owned or leased. Um, by a business entity that was uh, negatively affected by the state of emergency um, declared, and then it allows the Anne Arundel County to set any other criteria, amount, duration, uh, procedures, things like that. Okay, there's a motion. Favorable. Second. Second. All those in favor? Okay, unanimous. Okay. As Senator Roosevelt leaves for his bill. Glad to see you're here. Sorry, I didn't want to. Yeah, no, I'm glad you took care of that. Uh, Senate Bill 740. All right. Um, members, you have a reprint on your desk for this with an amendment submitted by Senator Rosa Pep. Um, this is out of finance as the primary. Um, they did not adopt this amendment. I don't know that they had it, but it was submitted for your consideration here in budget and tax. Uh, generally, what this bill does is within the Department of Commerce, it sets up a uh, COVID-19 small business grant program, which is to provide any sort of emergency relief funding through two calendar years, 2021 and 2022, to small businesses that experience at least a 25% reduction in gross receipts, um, either due to any sort of quarantine um, regulations or for market forces. Um, basically, the Department of Commerce on page three of the bill would distribute to a county a portion of the funds on a per capita basis, and then it would be up to the county to distribute it to any eligible small businesses. 
Um, you can see at the bottom of the page three uh, is the amendment, and it basically um, strikes some of the existing uh, as introduced language about the funding sources for it, and instead says that a grant will be funded through any available federal coronavirus relief money provided to the state. That same change um, is made on under under the bill, federal bill for either any time in calendar years 2020 through 2022. Finally, as introduced, the bill comes in and the amendment does not impact this um, reporting requirements um, about the funding sources and disbursements made to small businesses in the counties. Um, finally, this act is an emergency measure and will expire June 30th, 2024. Okay, and so this is another one of those <laughs> that uh, Senator Riley might not love. Um, it's all federal money, though, right? Yeah, yeah. No. <laughs> yes. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I worked with a number of the local economic development agencies. I kind of looked at what they've been doing last year to try to help the very small businesses, and we came up with this proposal. I introduced it, you know, two months ago. We didn't know whether they're going to have federal money or not. I put it in there. If we did, and now I think, given that we know we have so much federal money, uh, it's kind of another tool in the toolbox. Anybody have any thoughts, comments, Senator Zucker? So I saw in the fiscal note this says a hundred million. Is that still the case? The amendment strikes that. Okay. What is it? I thought it was a hundred million. Yeah, so um, basically from the lot bottom of line of page three to the top of page four, the bill initially st had an, inst an intent statement. Um, that the General Assembly is intending that $100 million in federal and state funds would be designated for the program. That's struck and replaced with um, any available federal funds. Gotcha. Gotcha. There's not a number associated with it. Right. Okay. Is there a motion? Sen oh, Sen Senator Young, did you have a question? Uh, just curious, is anybody keeping tabs on all the Federal money, we keep saying. Uh, believe me, I do. <laughs> Every single day. Are we still good? We are still very good. Okay, thank you. <laughs> All those in favor? Unanimous. Okay, I think that is it for today. Um, Actually, there's only one uh, that we have to have a floor leader. Uh, Senator Alfreth, you want to take that? Okay, very good. Thank you all. Have a good night. See you tomorrow.